Well, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us for our spring 2023 crop insurance update meeting. This is Corey with KW Insurance and I am going to walk you through um, suggestions for this coming crop year, kind of where we're at for prices and why we think staying in those county that ECO and SEO program will be a good um, position to be in, I think, going forward into this year. So um, starting off, if you ever want to review any of this stuff or even look at stuff like our uh, crop rotation spreadsheet, you can always go to our crop insurance education online tab and there you can find not only this video some soil health stuff and uh, also some quick reference sheets like if you're going to rotate from peas and lentils and things like that and how long of a break that you need to have so that's kwsunburst.com if you want to look at that um, so for the 2023 crop year the first just quick housekeeping thing we're going to review is we did actually switch to this um, agency management system on the crop insurance site called agency root some of you guys will get text messages from a number that isn't a 406 450 number like the rest of us have here it, it will look a little different and that number it actually is us communicating back and forth within this software with you so the cool thing is it logs our conversations back and forth it keeps us a good record of what we need to do for you guys and then also when you're anytime we meet with you we type up a summary to kind of keep track of where we're at so if Lynette meets with you one day and then I meet with you the next I, I kind of pick up where she left off hopefully so the other thing is um, you're going to get quote sheets or if you haven't already sent to you probably by email or mail if you weren't at our meetings if you look at this quote sheet there's going to be three lines on there the top lines are just plain old revenue protection so that's the, you know it'll all be at 75 percent because in our opinion that's the best level to be at the next line down will be ec seo and then the next line down would be eco and you would stack all those coverages together to come up with your total premium and your total coverage and we'll get into the eco seo stuff later on in this slideshow the back sheet of your quote sheet, um, it'll have a blue header on it like this. On those, we put just 100 acres in every unit of every crop on your policy, and so it's averaging all your canola units together to give you kind of a rough number for your farm averaged out. So a lot of you probably would prefer just to go back there and look at that. It'll give you a snapshot of where your premium would be at as a whole on your farm. Those previous pages, if you want to get more in-depth, we'll break it down by the unit for you. So. The other thing is there's going to be some checklists that you're going to get sent uh, that have been sent to you that are really important to go through some of the more important things on here is if you made any changes to your entity if you did any new breaking that's something we need to address before march 15th here and then your general cropping plan going forward which helps us give you better advice on our end so if you would take the time to fill all those out and also write down whatever you want for coverage levels and whether you want eco or seo on there this sheet actually is just kind of a good double check between what we fill out on your applications and what your intentions are. So it just gives us another way to possibly fix something going forward if, if we need to. Plus, it helps us catch some stuff that maybe needs to be done by March 15th here. So, so 2022 in review. A severe drought that spread south. The only place it actually was pretty good was up by the Sweetgrass Hill. So about uh, five miles north of our office was decent south of there the drought got quite a bit worse so compared to last year which 2021 was a pretty darn bad drought year we had paid out 16.2 million dollars out of our agency last year at that point in claims this year actually came in at 17.2 which shows you the drought actually got more severe not not less and on top of that the commodity prices elevating actually helped give us a little more coverage in the crop insurance side but really it focuses on the value of crop insurance, right? For us, that that much money was dispersed when it needed to be when we hit bad years like this last one. Very likely more to come for payments for you guys from SCO and ECO. If you were in that last year, you'll be getting that in April here in a couple of months. So that's good news for some more financial support that's coming. And then just on a, a uh, proper self up note here, this is actually more the team outside of me anyways, but Lynette and Darcy and Renee and Teresa Everybody that's working on collecting and inputting maps for you guys input about 365,000 acres of maps, um, all of which was done without a single claim affecting error. So just give them, I give them some props. They're probably more valuable by far than what I'm doing here at this agency from an accuracy standpoint. And we're pretty proud of that, I think. So changes for 2023. Oats are now eligible for revenue protection. So on 
your guys's applications if even if you're not changing anything else we're going to have you sign them because we certainly would want to enroll you in revenue protection on oats that crop is going to track a futures market which is the i think soft white wheat futures the same thing anyways that um, malt barley tracks so if the wheat market plummets that also will drag the the oats down with it if wheat really ramps up it'll it'll drag oats up with it as well and the other thing is we're offering now or the usda is a five dollar an acre premium credit for all certified organic producers so they really want to push the organic thing uh, they think it fits well into their climate modeling i think and stuff and so if you're an organic producer you're going to pay five dollars an acre less in premium than you would have paid for the same coverage the previous year because they're giving you that credit um the importance of reporting all your shareholders in your entity the RMA released a final rule on this just last fall saying if you fail to report all the persons with substantial beneficial interest on your policy, so that'd be anybody with 10% or more interest in your farming operation, whether it's a corporation and you had 10% or more shares of stock, if you're married, you and your wife both need to be on there. If we miss someone that is an SBI, it will actually void your entire policy. So that, that would be really bad, right? So if you guys have made any changes, added a kid on there, um, switch stuff around with how your shared holders work. If you've gotten married, that is probably one of the more important things we need to know to avoid having a major boondoggle on the claims side. Um, schedules of insurance, we always just go through this to show you guys how to read these things. But basically, first off, look at the front cover of this. All your crops are color coded and most of you guys know what crop is where at least off of this map. So if that looks wrong, let us know. Something's wrong with the way either you filled out your FSA maps or, or something we did. But Regardless, that's a good first double check. The next page then will summarize all your acres. If you look at the total acres at the bottom, everybody has a pretty good snapshot of that. If that's not matching up, we definitely need to look at fixing that. And then it splits it out by crop as well for you. Inside of there, when you look at the schedule of insurance, it's going to have multiple lines for the same field on there if you're in ECO and SEO. So your revenue protection line will be on one line the ECO on the next and the SEO on the next. So if you look at that and you see, geez, these same acres are listed three times, look over here and it probably says SEO and then ECO and then RP on the next one. So the back page of your schedule, that's the best place to find what your guarantees are for your coming payment on ECO and SEO. If you look at the premium liability column on those and then you scroll down, you're going to see here's our barley. This is Wendy's stuff. Revenue protection, 1,100 acres of barley is $150,000 an acre guarantee. And then the ECO here added $17,000 and SEO 21,000. So whatever we were gonna get out of the revenue protection side, we've already finished our claim on and that's been paid, but we have not been paid or any of us have on the SEO and ECO. If you total those up, if we tell you that crop looks like it's gonna pay, that's what your payment on the SEO, ECO will be or close. If the commodity prices went up, that that amount actually will go up if you if you increase the price from the base to the harvest price. But that'd give you a pretty good estimate to take to the bank, anyways. Um, beginning farmer rancher, this is a pretty big deal on the discount end, and so you must have had less than five years of an insurable interest in a farmer ranch. Um, five, not have had more than five years, so up to five years, anyways. May exclude anyone under the age of eighteen for years of experience. Uh, active duty in the military or gone to college. So if you added your kids on your corporation when they graduated high school for some reason, then they went to college for four years, we can exclude the four years they were in college from their experience. Otherwise, um, the worst thing that you could do for your kids' sake for the discounts on this program would be to add them on your corporation just to make them part of the farming operation. Um, but not have them actively farming really because if they're more than 10 percent of your entity those years of experience are ticking away so what we always advise people to do and this would affect probably their stuff at the fsa side of the beginning farmer too is try to avoid adding children or anything into your entity and then if they start farming start them off on their own separate entity so they get to use this five years of bfr because it can add up to a lot of money if you're on a fair number of acres so um if you're looking at doing this, some sort of planning, like how to get your kids involved in the farm, it'd be good to talk to us and talk to the FSA side to make sure you don't screw up some of the, the benefits they get when they're starting out. We need to fill that application out um, by this March 15th deadline. So if they get an additional 10% premium subsidy. That means on something like enterprise units, they are already are subsidized at 80%. 
they would then be subsidized to 90% or the government would pay 90% of the premium in that scenario. So their premium would be cut in half for five years on there. So a pretty big deal, right? To keep them eligible for that until they can start actually using it. Um, easier tr to transfer yields from a previous producer if you're a BFR. And then you get to use 80% of the county average in bad years for yield substitutions instead of 60% like the rest of us. So, native sod breaking, we've harped and harped and harped on this, but if you're going to do it, you need to contact us before March 15th here so that we can get our ducks in a row and you need to have a plan with the FSA too. This especially applies to stuff that says native sod on your maps, right? Stuff that's never been farmed before. You can get yourself in a whole world of problems if you don't line that out with the FSA first before you break that out. So um, if you do that through us, through, for the first four years, it's going to be penalized. So you're only going to get 65% of the county average and they're going to take 50 points of premium subsidy away. So you're going to pay a pretty high premium, not have much coverage for four years. And then after that four years, it rolls into just normal production. It used to be that we could avoid this by seeding like a forage crop on there that wasn't insurable through us. Now, pretty much you have to seed it four years up to an insurable crop before it falls off of that penalty, unless you go a whole 10 years out from when you break it. So, so be, be aware of that. Um, the next thing is CRP breaking. The good thing with those things, whether it's CRP or coming out of an EQIP program, is you receive 100% of the county average of seeded within two years of coming out of that USDA program. But where we get in a pickle sometimes is people lose track either of when that actually came out. And so they may, the person they're leasing this from may have said, oh yeah, that came out in 2019. Well, it actually was 2017 and it was hate a couple of years and they didn't remember. So make sure you verify before you take on a lease with the FSA when this ground actually came out. Then the other thing to be cognizant of is that the fall of 2019. So like if your CRP came out in the fall of 2019 in this example, that would be the 2020 crop year you're starting there, just like had you seeded winter wheat. So you'd have the 2020 and the 2021 crop year to get this seeded. So you'd have till the spring of 21. If you went to the fall of 21 and seeded it to winter wheat, that'd be the start of the 2022 crop year. And then you would have to do a written agreement to get this insured and you'd get a reduced yield. So pretty important to kind of get that seeded within that two year period if you're going to capitalize on this um, additional coverage they basically allow you through the USDA programs. If you have some stuff like that's just been out for a long time and you're now going to break it out, please contact us because there's some other rules on that. Um, and it needs to be addressed by the sales closing date. So by March 15th in this scenario here. If it's out more than two years, it becomes new breaking, requires a written agreement, and you'll either get 65% or 80% of the county average just for the first year that you do this, of course. Um, and that all depends on what soil type it falls into. Those written agreements must be submitted preferably by this deadline. If this slips through the cracks, we can do up to, I think, 320 acres by um, acreage reporting time. But if we get over that many acres or for some reason it's in some weird soil type that we can't do that with, then we need to have had it done before this deadline. So for the practical purpose, I would say let us know about any new breaking you're doing pretty quick like here, certainly before March 15th. Oh, and if you were going to seed winter wheat um, on new breaking ground, so this isn't CRP, but stuff that's now new breaking, it has to be um, sprayed out by July 15th. And then if you're going to seed a spring crop on new breaking, it has to have been broke out the fall before. So before November 30th, I think it is. So CRP, you can just seed right into that. But if it's actually call, call classified as new breaking now because it's been out too long, that you actually have to make sure you broke it out in the fall before you're going to seed it in the spring. And that's one other place we've run into some issues here. So if you're adding land, if you get over 2,000 acres of added land, then you're basically down to just using the county average for that land unless somehow you can roll that producer's history into your own operation, which there are ways to do that. If you were part of the farming and management decisions of that farm, they could sign the history over to you. If that's not an option though, you just bought this land and don't have access to any history. Once you get over that 2000 acre mark, instead of being able to use the average of all your other yields to possibly establish a higher starting yield for the new land, you're just stuck with the county average on that 2000 acres. So the projected prices for next year, um, winter wheat was 877 a bushel. Spring wheat came in at 893 a bushel this spring. So the futures market, dropped off a little bit, right? Because spring wheat's usually higher than winter wheat, but not, not terrible. So we're close to the same spring wheat and winter wheat. The one thing we do have going for us is the volatility factor on the spring wheat is down. 
because the market hasn't been moving much. And so if that holds up through the end of this month, I'll take you guys through why that will improve your uh, premium going forward anyways. It'll help you not pay as much premium for as much coverage. So Durham Wheat actually got a 14% premium to spring. As you can see, this isn't anywhere near reality as to where Durham contracts are to spring wheat at the moment. Um, but it is a little bit better premium than last year because I think we were at 3%. So if you look at this, we're at 893 on spring wheat and 1018 on Durham. So there is a bit of a premium built in there. That is a 10-year average of the Durham versus spring wheat prices. And so it's slow to change. It's, it doesn't react the way it should to where the market's at. And that would be one thing that would be really good to get changed in the crop insurance in. Um, there are organic prices listed on your two for your organic growers. You, you can look through that. Um, canola is 27 cents. That's pretty close to where it was last year. Oats, 430 a bushel, which is really a pretty high price to start off with on oats. At least that's where it's averaged at at the moment. And we'll, we'll know here once it finishes its discovery. But oats look attractive from that standpoint. And then barley, 562 a bushel. If you don't have a contract, that would be your feed barley price. So the next slide, this just shows the volatility factors on winter wheat versus spring wheat and the historical volatility stuff in there so basically winter wheat last fall was bouncing all over right and we were still kind of in the midst of what's going to go on with this drought and the ukraine war and stuff so this is basically the same factor they use to price your puts and calls like how expensive it would be to buy insurance on whether the market's going to go up or down so last fall it was really volatile on winter wheat so it was a 0.32 the spring wheat i'm sorry it's probably under my picture here but it came in at like 0.17 so far the spring wheat, we won't know until the end of February what it really comes out at. But so far, the market is pretty stagnant here. So I would hope that it ends up in the same ballpark. And, and what does that have to do with my premium? So this slide then shows you where we use the volatility factor in figuring your premiums. So we can go into the actuarials for any of these crops. That's stuff you guys can look at too on the RMA USDA website if you want. If you go on the actuarial information browser and you go into the crop, in there, it will show you at the, um, in this scenario, at the 13% volatility factor at the 75% level on your crop insurance, you're going to pay 35% in premium of whatever your coverage is. So in this scenario, you'd pay 35% of 100 bucks would be 35 bucks an acre. The government pays 65% of your premium. And so for a $20 acre guarantee on this slide, it'd be 244 an acre, let's say, or 12.2% anyways. If you had a volatility factor closer to where winter wheat ended up, that exact same coverage then for the 0.34 on this chart takes us all the way up to you paying 18% instead of 13. So you can see as these numbers, those volatility numbers bounce around, it can really affect what you guys pay for the same amount of coverage, basically. On a, the pulse crops, these are our best guesses for prices on those. Um, but on green and yellow peas, we're guessing 15 cents a pound. Uh, Small kabulis 26, large kabulis 31. So the pulse is really pretty close to where they were last year. And then lentils, I think, will be up a little because that market has been up. So 28 cents a pound on that. You guys that are getting quote sheets, those are the prices we're currently using on there. We don't get the official prices released until about the first week of March. So it's another kind of difficult thing how that program works because it doesn't give us a lot of time between sales closing and when the prices are released to actually get you the official prices on this, but that that's just is what it is. For now, if you use those, you should probably be, I would guess, within 10% of where they're gonna shake out, um, but we will have official prices here coming pretty quickly. So the SEO payments for last year, it was a pretty bad year all over the state of Montana, except for little pockets, like up in the very Northern part here, or maybe in Glacier County. So the yields for SEO for the 2022 crop year, they'll be released at the end of March. So it, within a month, hopefully here, month and a half, we'll know if you're going to get paid for sure. But we have a lot of data at our agency, at least for Toole County. And we know from the east side, um, Liberty, Hill, Ponderé, even, those were really bad drought counties, so I would count on it paying there. Extremely likely to pay in all counties due to drought. The wild cards will be Glacier County because part of that county was pretty good and part not so good. Um, Toole County's barley was pretty good, but we're going to get into the data that we have here showing that possibly it's even going to pay on barley, I think, in Toole County. And that's because the bulk of the barley was concentrated up here, though, where the better crops were. That's the only reason it's even on the edge. The rest of the crops in Toole County, I think, pretty good chance. Um, it's very likely to pay due to inflated prices and drought for this next year. And at the end of this presentation, we'll cover why that is as well. 
for your PLC payments at the FSA, you would have been expecting or would have gotten those in October of this last fall for the previous crop year or October this next year for this last crop year. But regardless, the prices, thank God, now are up high enough that none of the PLC is triggering. So I would, wouldn't expect any payments from the FSA either on the PLC or really on the ARC side. The only way ARC's even going to have a chance of paying is if you had an absolutely terrible disaster in a county because the price of wheat is so high compared to the ARC base price, which I'd be glad to explain in detail to you sometime if you wonder which program looks like it'll pay. So ERP funding for 2022, it does look like the funding pass for another to re-up another round of this program. We haven't seen any rules on it yet. Assuming that it works as though it did the year prior, they'd probably still pull data from the RMA. And if your individual farm crops fell under 75% um, of what your average yield is, basically that, that would probably throw you into an ERP payment. But long story short, um, Basically, if you had a crop insurance loss, you very well might qualify for some ERP money from this last crop year, as well as SEO and ECO if it works the way that it did before. So if you wonder what your odds are of getting paid for SEO and ECO, just look at the Tool County drought map, basically, right? And that, that hasn't changed a lot since last year. So anywhere here that's in the orange or the red, very likely counties to pay on these county disaster programs anyways. Uh, we added safflower to our rotation sheet. Safflower has basically similar rotation restrictions to like a mustard. So basically, just don't put safflower where you had a broadleaf crop the year before. There's only a one-year break requirement on that. So if you kind of keep that in your head and just put safflower where there was a grass crop like wheat or barley, I think you'll be fine. If you want to do the safflower where there was a broadleaf before, please talk to us or at least refer to this chart. Because in theory, you could do smooth peas and then safflower or something like that. But you can't do lentils and safflower. So there's some weird um, things for that crop in there. These are all the counties we can insert safflower in now. I mean, you can see Tool and Glacier really are the only two that don't have it up around us. And the more written agreements that are done, the more likely it'll be that that's added in there. There are quite a few written agreements being done in Tool County because there is a safflower oil press coming in here. So as far as growing safflower, um, April 1st is the earliest seeding date. So slightly early, earlier than wheat and barley, but lines up pretty close. May 20th is the late planting period would start. So you want to have it seeded by then. And then your insurance period ends October 31st. And with this crop, that might actually be the one thing that might come into play because I've heard it can get kind of late into harvest. So if we get to October 31st, you'd want to call us and have an appraisal done. And then they would come out, they'd count the plants, give you a yield, and it going forward then very well would be your baby um, since we're past the end of the insurance period. But at least we'd qualify you for a loss payment if um, potentially there was a loss there on that. So... 25 cent for conventional and 31 cent for organic base price. Liberty County's average yields, um, 726 pounds for conventional and 581 for organic. So about 130 bucks an acre is a guarantee is all for that for now, um, for that crop in that county. The max contract price you can apply in organic is 63 cents. If you did that, that certainly would ramp up that coverage. But uh, So we can apply in a, a contract on the organic, but not on the conventional. The rest of the crops, the earliest you can start here, since we're getting close to seeding, is March 25th on peas and lentils. So that's a good crop to start with if you want to start seeding early. Wheat and barley is April 6th, and then canola and mustard, you're supposed to wait till April 15th. The only thing that happens if you seed before this date is you wouldn't qualify for a replant payment. If you seed before then and it gets established, that, that's fine, and then the insurance would carry on. The latest dates that you should still be seeding those without a penalty would be May 31st for wheat and barley. May 20th for uh, mustard and May 15th for canola and then May 15th for smooth peas and Austrians and then chickpeas and lentils you can go up to May 20th and then if you really get late you don't want a penalty flax lets you go till June 10th basically and then there's going to be what's called the end of the insurance period and the only crop that's different in this one are smooth peas and lentils so if you're not done cutting those by September 30th we need to know that so that we can get someone out there to appraise those ASAP so that we don't have some issues with your insurance getting paid the rest of them we have till October 31st. If we hit a really late harvest, oftentimes they'll give us exceptions to these, but at the very least, we need to let the company know. So enterprise versus optional units. If there was a one thing that you would focus on on your crop insurance to save a whole bunch of money, this would be it. There certainly are fits for optional insurance, and I go round and round with people, but we have uh, years and years of experience with big and little farms here, and as a whole, 
you come out better on enterprise units and optional units in the, in the end, at least in our experience, between the money you save in years when you have no claims, period. Or you might have had a little claim on an optional unit and not on the rest of the optional units, but the premium increase didn't make up for it on the rest of the units. So we're big fans of op- enterprise units mixed with SEO and ECO if possible. If you want to do optional units, that's great. And we are happy to quote it and it will keep all your stuff separate. So if one field gets hailed out or one field has a insect problem or something, it would cover that section separate from the rest of the farm. But the premium difference is pretty substantial. So how do I qualify for enter- enterprise units? Most importantly, you have to have two or more sections of that crop seeded at 20 or more acres each. So not only can we not just have one section of crop to qualify here, but we need to put 20 acres somewhere else, not five acres, right? Some crops don't have enterprise units. So mustard, for example, flax is another one. Um, those crops, you might as well keep optional units and keep it as separate as you possibly can. Uh, the rest of this stuff on the enterprise unit side, if you're only going to seed one section of canola and you're in enterprise units, it's well worth your money to drive down the road and do 20 more acres because it, with the prices elevated like they are now, it very well could be saving you 15 bucks or more an acre by doing that. So, so in this scenario, we've got 120 acres in section one here, only 15 in section two. That would not qualify, right? Because we didn't do the other 20 acres in a different section. This can even be in the same field boundary, basically. It just has to have a section line in the middle of the field that would cut it off if you want to look at it that way. So um, this one, we have 100 acres in section one and 30 acres in section two. So it would qualify, right? Because we have more than 20 acres there. You can also do enterprise units by county. If we have that option, and this option has to be added on your policy before March 15th, if you only have one section of land like this guy here, let's say in Ponderay County, and you want to pool it together with the sections in Tool County so you get the enterprise unit discount there, we can add that option on your policy and put Tool and Ponderay together and get you enterprise unit discounts on the whole thing. Now that also will throw all of that into one pot when your claim gets figured in the end, right? And so if it's way far apart, it might still be worth paying the optional unit rate and the Ponderay County stuff. But if for some reason you just farm on all the county the county line and you want everything to go together and you don't have enough land in the other county to get that extra section, then this is where that would fit. And enterprise units by type. So, uh, <laughs> all of us here in the Cropaturist world, our geeky people, we're pretty darn excited about this because this is a game changer for you guys. So we can now split winter wheat from spring wheat from Durham. And so they'd all be separate enterprise units in a claim scenario. So no longer do we have to throw the winter wheat together with the spring wheat is probably one of the biggest ones, right? To make this work though, we have to have 20 or more acres in two different sections of each type now. So before we would just see, we could see 20 acres of spring wheat here and then see 20 acres of winter wheat in a separate section. They were gonna go together anyways and that would give you your enterprise unit discount. So to make this work right and get you the full discount, we need to make sure you keep track of it by type and then you have 20 or more acres in two different sections that way. It's also the same for peas, chickpeas, and lentils. Those are even more different crops where they were thrown together. Now they're gonna be split up by enterprise unit by type as well. And the one thing we can't do that on yet is feed and malt barley. So if you're thinking of doing feed and malt barley together on the same farm and you're gonna be in enterprise units, it's still gonna throw those types together before the claim is paid. Same premium discount as before, for the most part, you just need to make sure that you have two different sections of each type. So this is a quick example, prior to 2022, it would have thrown all your spring wheat, durum and winter wheat together in one pot before the claim was paid. And then the same thing with the small kabuli, large kabuli, and then the smooth green and yellows and the lentils. Now it's gonna keep all those separate at claims time, which is a major, major advantage because chickpeas and lentils and peas, let's say they're very different crops. And to have those all thrown together into one enterprise unit never made any sense. And Sometimes the one good crop would take a failure on the other side out of a claim. So in this example, we've got 100 acres of winter wheat in this section and 40 acres in another. So that definitely qualifies for an enterprise unit. But then in the spring, you go and see 20 acre, 200 acres of spring wheat just in one section. In this scenario then, we could either throw the spring wheat then together into your winter wheat enterprise unit and we would all have one big enterprise unit with mixed types. Or you can say, I want to pay the extra premium for optional units, or that would be a basic unit in that scenario, but it'd be way more premium for the spring wheat 
we can keep the winter wheat separate in an enterprise unit and just roll forward that way. And we have to tell acreage reporting to sort that out. So if you guys forget, you don't see that second 20 acres for this type, we will talk to you and see which route you want to go. This is just an example of how it would be done correctly, which we'll skip through here. And this is a quote sheet. This was actually done with $4 wheat. I just left the same quote sheet in here because I'm kind of lazy, I guess. But it went from $3 basically an acre up to 8 bucks from enterprise to optional units. That now, because the price is more than double what that 4 something was on this quote, would be doubled here. So we'd be 6 bucks on the enterprise units and more like $16 on optional units. So you can save yourself 10 bucks an acre just by going and doing 20 acres down the road somewhere of these crops if you don't already have that done. For malt barley, just real quick review. Basically, they just use a, a local market price to determine what the value of your feed barley is compared to your malt. If And this only applies if your stuff doesn't make malt, right? If we have to use the malt endorsement part of this. Um, before, they used a futures market to come up with the feed price that was based off the corn futures. Now they're calling all the elevators around just to get an average of the feed price, and that's what we'll use for your um, bushel reduction. So real simply how it would work, let's say they called around, they got $3 feed barley bid and you had a $5 malt contract. It all got rejected. So now you're getting 60% of what your malt um, contract was going to be for the feed price. If you harvested 10,000 bushels of barley, you'd get 10,000 bushels that's only going to get 60% of it counted for your claim or only 6,000 bushels counted for your claim. And that's where your additional payment will come on the malt endorsement side. I'm still a real big fan of the malt endorsement. It's not as good as it was in the past um, when it first started, but this has applied it so many times up here when we've had some rain issues in the fall. And then the other thing it does is it allows us to apply your contract to your barley and keep you in revenue protection at the same time. So it's well worth the money, especially if you're an enterprise unit, I think. Flax and hemp were added in 2020. If you're seeding any of those crops, that are new to our county but you actually did flax in the past and didn't insure it any crop that we add on your policy that you actually have experience of growing in the past we need to go back and rebuild the history and if we don't do that you don't get to start with the 100 percent of the county average in these crops you only start at 65 percent of the county average so it can be a huge difference in your coverage if we're adding crops like flax on here and you're going to do that this year and you know you did it in the past, please let us know and we'll work on rebuilding your history. We'd have till April 29th to do that. Triticale can be grown in, for grain in these counties now. So everything around us except Glacier, basically. And then it appears Hill County hasn't been added yet either, which hopefully will get done here pretty quick. Like, So if you want to do this in Glacier and Hill, we can do it. We just need to do a written agreement before March 15th. This actually is kind of an attractive thing for people that were growing triticale anyways, especially if you're planning on take it to grain because um, now we can insure it. The base price is $6.79 a bushel, which is substantially higher. And this should be for 2023, I'm sorry, instead of 2022. But $6.79 a bushel this year. We can also use a contract with a max increase of up to $15 a bushel for this. So if you can get a triticale contract to grow for seed, and they will ensure all your um, bushels of production. We could actually increase it up to even 15 bucks a bushel here. There's no SEO available for it, so that's kind of a bummer. It can be winter or spring type. And then there's some pretty darn high starting yields. So if you look in our average, Tool County area two is kind of the average of our county here anyways. You start with 33 bushels an acre on recrop and 45 bushels an acre on spring. On the best part of our county, the map area four is 49 bushels on recrop and 61 on spring. So pretty high county average yields that they have established for this program to start out here. Be pretty high coverage if you take that times six bucks. So it's a kind of an attractive crop um, from a cash flow standpoint, just from the insurance standpoint. There is no revenue protection on that. So that's a downer and no SEO available. So those two things aren't working in its favor. But if it's something you're planning on doing anyways, it's cool that we can have insurance for it. Um, flax was new in 2020. These are all the counties we can assure it in, so everything along the high line pretty much. Um, as far as growing flax, you can use Spartan on that. We we grow flax on our farm, so it's kind of a cool crop. You can use Spartan to control the Cochin Russian thistle, clethid, and for the grasses. And then you can actually come back with a pass of like um, bronate, bromoxyl, and MCP together if you need to clean up any weeds later. 
we never had to do that side of it on the flax, but it's a weird kind of a hybrid between a broadleaf and a um, grass crop where we can use some of those chemistries from both sides of that. Real good mycorrhiza fungi crop. There's the little soil health plug and then can have stubble issues when seeding back into it with heavy flax residue, especially if you don't have a stripper header and a disc drill. So um, no enterprise units on flax. That makes a premium kind of high. No revenue protection. So no harvest price type adjustment on that. And you know that flax market bounced around a lot the last couple of years. Revenue protection would really help there. But we don't have that on that crop. There's no rotation restrictions. The earliest you can plant, that's April 11th and the latest June 10th, like we already talked about. And the conventional base price for this year is 17 bucks a bushel. They may release an additional price. So on these APH crops, sometimes they'll come out with another price and say, okay, we're going to increase that from 17 to 19 or something. But we won't know that until the first part of March. And then on organic, flax is super attractive crop for organic at the moment because the base price is $40 a bushel on that. So even if you started with um, a 10 bushel average in organic or a seven, seven bushel guarantee, that still is $360 an acre guarantee there. So organic flax is worth a lot of money. It's a good guarantee crop. And if you're organic, I would look at that possibly as part of your rotation there. So the other thing with flax is SEO is based off of the whole state's yields instead of just the county, like just tool counties, because there's not enough acres of it in, in our given counties to establish a yield, I guess. So it's possible... SEO may or may not pay the way you predict it would for you on flax because it is based off the whole state. Now that could work in your favor, like in a year like this where it was drier south of us than it was um, necessarily up here by the hills. Or it could work against us if Toole County was in a drought, but then the rest of the state was pretty good. But just so you understand how that works, we still stay in it on our own farm and it's paid um, when it's been droughty, it's been paying, so it's been working, but it could end up not working the way you would expect because of how they pool the stuff together. This is just a quote on flax. Um, I'm just going to skip past that, but we'd be glad to quote flax for you. Hemp, we don't have anybody really that's growing hemp here yet, but you have to have one year of experience growing it to even try and insure it. Once you get that one year of, exper one year of experience, then we can add that on as an insurable crop here. Um, if it ends up with over 0.3 THC content, that's not an insurable cause of loss. Plus, they'll probably make you destroy that hemp crop. So there's your biggest risk there is high THC content. The crop may be destroyed and we don't pay you on the insurance. So just be aware of the risk. Um, the crop could be appraised out, but no loss payment. can take up to two weeks after harvest to figure out the THC issue sometimes. So, And then the Tool County guarantee, this was last year's for grain, was only 150 bucks an acre. So not a real high guarantee for dry land grain. $750 an acre for oil, but that's a much more intensive process. And um, it, to be insurable, it can't be seeded where there was a broadleaf crop the year before, more or less, right? So no, you couldn't have had cannabis, canola, dry beans, dry peas, mustard, rapeseed, soybeans, or sunflowers the year prior. And um, if your certification or license is terminated during the year, that will also void your coverage. So there's a lot of weird quirks in this. If you're going to do hemp, make sure you talk pretty in-depth with your insurance agent so you, at least you understand that part of it. Not to say it's not a crop that should be grown. It just the insurance side is, is a little bit strange. So. so how about Camelina? We're getting a lot of questions on that. There's some pretty attractive contract options on Camelina where they'll guarantee you like 300 bucks an acre if you have a stand established and stuff. That side's good. There's some confusion on those contracts whether you actually even have an insurable interest in the crop at all anymore at that point. And if you don't, they become the operator at the FSA, not you, which can jeopardize some things like um, PLC payments because it might affect you not having enough acres seeded for the base that you have and things like that. So if you're going to do a Camelina contract, make sure you take it to the FSA and make sure that you can be the operator on that. If you can't, that might be fine, but you want to be upfront about what's going on so it doesn't screw you up on the government payment side. Also on our side, it can only be insured up to the 65% level right now. There's no SEO insurance available for it. We have to have a contract to insure it here. So you would have to get a contract through those guys. And then we would use that contract price um, up to 34 cents, I think, for the coverage. And the coverage, at, when we just quoted this out, I think ended up being 130 bucks an acre or something like that for our county. So if you're going to do Camelina, just get a hold of us and we'll go through the specs with you on, on some of the quirks with that. 
Mustard, yellow, and brown types are insurable in, in most counties. It may not be in yours, see, because Glacier County and then east of Hill here, actually in the all the southern part of the state of Montana, it's not, and you'd have to do a written agreement for. So once again, those written agreements have to be done by March 15th. So if you're doing mustard, you want to insure it. You need to let your insurance agent know ASAP on that. Even if you are in a county where mustard is insurable, yellow and brown types are the only insurable types in most counties. So if you're in Tool County, it's insurable here, but if you're gonna do Oriental mustard, we need to get a written agreement done on that by March 15th. So if you're getting contracts um, for mustard and you're doing it on the Oriental type, even if you have grown yellow mustard in the past, make sure you talk to your insurance agent because the Oriental type probably you'll need to do a written agreement on. Same rotation restrictions as canola, basically. There's a lot of canola being contracted now too because there is some kind of attractive act of God contracts on that. On the hail insurance side, you can only do excess 10 on canola. That means that if you have a $100 loss that you paid for 100 bucks worth of insurance, we'll only pay you $90 back basically. So no matter what your damage is, we're taking 10% off on that. I, I don't know who came up with that product or why it is the way it is, but that is just the way that that works, just so you know. On the multi peril side, April 15th is your earliest planting date, and then March 15th is your latest. This crop does actually freeze kill relatively often, so not seeding way before that date or seeding before the earliest planting date usually is a good idea to just wait because the replant payment right now, even on kind of an average yield area, would be about 49 bucks an acre. So you'd be giving up that replant if it winter kills if you seed before that date. And then after May 15th, the penalty ramps up really quick for late seeding too. So, so where you're at in the county also, if you're in a county where there's map areas, which Tool County is that way, Hill County is that way, um, if there, your map area really affects your starting yield on something like canola. So like for us here on our farm, we'd be more like this 1,031 pounds starting yield. We'd be at $232 an acre probably for a guarantee for canola here at 75%. And somebody in the better map area might be closer to 300. So if you hear your neighbors talking about $300 an acre canola guarantees on insurance, make sure you're in the same map area they are if you're planning on going that same route. Anyways, it's kind of an expensive crop to insure, but not really as bad as you would think for the amount of coverage you get because you can do enterprise units in this, right? So. Here we have SEO and ECO and revenue protection all stacked together. The revenue protection is 12 bucks an acre and it guarantees you 232, so pretty cheap. Like 5% like of what your guarantee is there. And then if you stack the rest of that on there, that gets you up to 27 bucks an acre for $294 an acre of potential payout with SEO and ECO on there. So still less than 10% premium paid into that total coverage. So I still think that is a really good deal, especially for dry land Montana here, right? For the odds of us having a claim in any given year. Contract pricing is only available on the high lake type varieties. So that'd be Nexera. There's not much of that, if any, growing in Montana anymore. If you do grow a high lake variety and you get a contract, we could apply that to your insurance. Um, that's any variety of canola not containing more than 3.5% of linoleic acid. So what's happening here is we got a lot of new seed contracts getting signed. They're good contracts, like at 18 bucks, let's say, for an act of God, but it's not a high lake variety of canola, so we can't use that yet on the insurance. They're lobbying pretty hard to get that added because it, that, that would be really beneficial not only to them, but to you guys too, to be able to add that extra contract price. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we can get that sorted out. Um, you can use contract prices on all organic types of canola, and there's some pretty uh, attractive organic contracts. So if you're on the organic side, you might be up around 300 bucks an acre, depending on what map area you're in for guarantees on canola. So you might want to look into that. On the quality loss side on these crops, pretty much anything that happens to wheat or barley that's going to cause some quality issue would be covered on your crop insurance to some extent, except for protein. So it is so important if you're going to have this adjusted while it's in the bin to have the adjuster take those samples and send them off to the state grain lab because you don't know maybe your wheat falls into us number two for some reason or there's low falling numbers that you didn't even realize and if you finish that claim up before checking on that part it could be thousands of dollars of difference in your claim because they'll reduce your production down to help pay for some of that if you had a quality issue so 
If you think there's any chance you have a quality issue, you need to have the adjuster come out and have them do it within 60 days of harvest. That's one of the biggest things. So if your adjusters are really busy like they were last year because it's a drought, at least get them to come out, take your samples and send them off or see if they're okay with you sending samples off to the state grant lab and them using it. But usually they need to come take it anyways. So, so P and lentil adjustments, um, those are way more straightforward. Basically, whatever the number one price is in this example for lentils at the elevators, let's say it's 25 cents, they're going to take then what you got for reduced graded lentils. So if they're number threes and you got 15 cents a pound and you should have got 25 cents for number ones, they divide 15 into 25 and they're going to figure out you got 60% of the price you should have had those been number ones and they're going to reduce your production down to 60% of what you harvested. So in this example, we cut 10,000 bushels of lentils. We got 15 cents because they were number threes. We should have had 25 cents if they were ones. They're going to only count 6,000 bushels of that against you for your claim. So that's how you get paid for that quality loss issue. Uh, must be sampled within 60 days of harvest. That's a big deal on all these crops. So make sure if you think there's any chance of a quality loss issue, you have your adjuster send that stuff off. Don't just settle it in the bin without doing that. Chickpea specific rules, basically ask a kind of resistant varieties are the only insurable types. All, all the stuff we grow around here are that at least, I think. Um, the seed must be treated with recommended fungicides. And this is a pretty big deal. It actually has to have Ascochyta control on the label. So if you're an organic guy, there's really no way to get coverage on chickpeas that would pay if that is the reason that that crop failed was Ascochyta. It doesn't mean that it won't pay if you're an organic guy if they drought out or they get hailed out. But if Ascochyta blight is your problem, um, if you're a conventional guy and you don't treat the seed, you're carrying that risk on your own. And then if you're an organic guy, that ask a kind of things, one thing that's not covered on the insurance, unless you can prove that you treated it with something to control it. You also have to try to control it in the field if it shows up, even if you treated the seed. We need, they'll need proof that you use chemicals for that. So we haven't had this issue here really much, if at all. That's because we've been in multiple years of drought, and that's not a big issue in the drought usually. But if we get some wet years and there's a lot of ask a kind of, this could show up and, and be a real bummer for somebody to not get a loss payment because of this. So just want to make sure you understand that part. On cover crops, same as last year, must be terminated 35 days prior to planting a fall crop. So if you're going to seed winter wheat, um, September 15th, let's say, you just need to make sure it was sprayed out 35 days prior to that. Um, to qualify for summer, follow for the next crop year. It has to be terminated by June 1st. Almost nobody can do that with a cover crop. So basically, we just tell everybody, if you seed cover crop, it's going to be recropped the next year, right? And then fall seeded cover crop, um, you can seed any time in the spring following a fall seeded cover crop because the winter terminates it basically. So, so there's not that 35 day lag for the spring crop in that scenario. And rotation restrictions apply to the plants that are in the cover crop mix too. So if you want to seed peas this next year and you had smooth peas in your cover crop the year prior, you wouldn't qualify for insurance because the smooth peas follow the same rotation restrictions just as though you had seeded peas in the field. So just make sure you understand what's in your mix and how long you need to wait before you seed um, some of those rotation crops back in there. We're getting close to the end here, but um, SEO and ECO, those are both county-based programs. SEO subsidized at 65% and ECO subsidized at 44%. So there's part of the discrepancy, discrepancy in premium. The other thing is ECO starts triggering when the county gets below 95% of its average. SEO, it has to get down to 86% um, to start triggering. So much more likely that ECO pays, but it's more money, not only because of the lower subsidy, um, but because of the more likelihood of it paying too, right? On SEO, it starts to pay at the 86% level. Once you get down to your individual crop insurance level, so if the county gets down to 75% average, then you get all your money out of that program. This has happened multiple, multiple times in our counties because not only of drought, but if the grain market drops, you could have an average crop in the county, but maybe the market dropped down to 75% of where we started. The revenue drop can also trigger this as well. So there's multiple ways this can trigger. Um, ECO, just like SEO, like we said, but it's from 95% on down. You can um, actually be an ARC and ECO together at, if you want, if you wanted to be an ARC at the FSA for some reason, but you can't be an ARC and SEO together. So 
for now, we always tell people select PLC at the FSA. Neither one of those programs are likely to pay anyways, PLC or ARC for the foreseeable future. And then you can stack SEO and ECO on top there. So, so our historical payouts at our office, um, for the first six years of this program, there was about $1.3 million paid into premium and it paid out about six and a half million dollars. So really good return. That's um, Tool, most of our business is in Tool, Liberty, Glacier, Pend Oreille, and Hill Counties, basically. So just so you get a snapshot of the high line there. But any county where you're going to hit major droughts like we have, this is going to pay. You're going to hear agents talk about how this doesn't work in our county. If that's the case, that means you've had good crops multiple years in those counties, and you're actually your yields are higher than ours are now, so your odds are higher of paying, not lower. So don't ever listen to an agent that says this won't work in our county. That's nonsense. Um, if you ever want to call our office and discuss that, this is one thing I'm pretty passionate about. Those counties the yields have been ramping up in, and it actually makes more sense to be in it in those counties than in our own now, in my opinion. So in 2021, though, we hit a drought, major drought up here on the High Line, plus the prices um, doubled on some of the commodities if you're looking at Paul's crops. So $718,000 just in that one year paid in a premium and $7 million paid out in lost payments. So you can see what a huge impact that makes just in our little book of business at our insurance office when we hit bad years. That's money that these customers would not have received had they not enrolled in these county programs. And it's a fair thing because you're paying into a pot that hopefully we go on a two or three or four year stretch where it doesn't pay and we pay in and some other counties getting the money out of it, right? Um, but we've had a lot of years of drought in a row here and so it's been very helpful. Also, like I talked about, on the revenue declines, it covers you on that end as well. Um, ECO, same thing. Of course, it paid out um, just right in line with SEO because it pays before it does, right? And so it, we only have one year of experience of that so far, but it paid out $893,000 for $200,000 of premium. So real good return there. Like we talked about, the darker these colors are, the more likely it is not only to have paid last year, but we're headed into this droughty situation for the next year the more likely in these counties that it is to pay for the following crop year probably. So what our data shows now for, this is for Tool County. We can pool all of the yield together for what you guys report to our agency and come up with the number internally, at least that gets us close. So Tool County is one of them that's closer to on the edge because of the, the little pocket of good up here. But even with the good stuff in our county, if you look at wheat here, our base county wheat yields 36 bushels. The base price was 919, so they were saying $330 expected revenue for our county. Within our agency, all the yields reported to us averaged out at 25 bushels an acre. The price went down a little bit to 895, so wheat in our county only came out at 68% of average. I think if anything, we're a little bit on the high side of where that number is going to fall because we have a lot of the um, higher yielding customers up by the hills here just because of the way the rainfall came this year. So wheat really likely to pay. I give that a 95% chance in Toole County and about 100% chance in Liberty, Hill, Blaine, Ponderay County area. Glacier County is going to be a tougher situation because there were some really good crops up in the north part and some not so good in the south. And we don't have as much data from Glacier, so we're just going to have to wait and see about a month on that. Barley in Toole County, there was some really good barley yields up by the hills, not as good down south. So you can see right now within our agency, we're at 82% of average. That means you'd get all your ECO money and about half your SEO if you're at 75% level. So still a return on both of those programs. It just may not pay out completely on SEO, but we need to wait and see there. Peas are in the same boat pretty much. Um, all the ECO I think will pay out, maybe not all the SEO, but if you're in Liberty Hill or Blaine, all these crops will pay there, I think, 100%. And then um, canola, that one was terrible everywhere. Part of that's the variety that New Seed has, just isn't yielding as well, and they're fixing that, I think. But regardless, really poor canola yields, even within our agency in Toole County, we're at 41% average. So you can pretty well bank on canola paying out on that program, on both ECO and SEO. We always take you through an example of our farm. Um, 4,090 acres of crop last year is what we had. There was a mix of crops in there. Some of it was cover crop, right? And the 600 acres of cover crop, that's not insurable. So on that, we don't get any ECO or SEO money. So with the 4,000 acres, there's probably 3,400 acres in this example that are insured. We're also enrolled in, in PLC at the FSA on 1,700 base acres of wheat. 
and 900 of barley. This is irrelevant at the moment because those programs aren't paying anyways, but it did matter back when we were in a lower wheat environment, right, price-wise. So, um, so for PLC on our farm, we won't get any payment. That's just what this slide is showing. We just follow these same slides through every year so you can track what's happening on our farm because it's probably similar to yours. What if we elected ARC? ARC won't pay in our county either this year. I'm pretty certain anyways because the wheat price was stuck at about 550 a bushel. It's bottomed out on ARC and that's not going to change for several years here because it's an Olympic average of the wheat price. So when that pro price comes back up on ARC and, and we get a better Olympic average price there, it might make sense some year to be an ARC and not an SCO. And, and we would be upfront with you on that, of course. So, but for now, it makes sense to stay in PLC because neither one of these are likely to pay. SEO is going to pay way better than this if you get in a disaster in your county anyways. And um, in this scenario, then ARC wouldn't have paid either. So we'll put nothing into that. Um, and then our actual SEO guarantees at our farm. On the barley end, I put barley is not going to pay on SEO. I think it will now looking at the data. But for this example, we're going to be conservative. So this isn't even the max payout that our farm possibly could have for this year, right? Our wheat, I think we'll get all the money out of, so $29,000 out of the wheat on SEO. Half on the peas, I guessed, $3,300, and then the canola, a full payout, just like we talked on the previous slide. And then our flax, I think, is a full payout because the whole state was pretty poor. So $6,500 on the flax. So our total SEO payout for our farm should be about $59,000. I think that's conservative, but that should give you a number at least to kind of give you a feel for where this is headed. Um, and then on the ECO side, because we also now can buy into ECO, we have double stacked county programs. So our farm now is insured up to 95% of its average yields. The top half, the ECO and SEO triggered off of what happens at the county, right? So our ECO total payout for all those crops, and they will all pay, I think, I think that's pretty safe to assume, would be $76,000 for our farm here. So 59,000 out of SEO, 76,000 out of ECO, or 136,000 extra dollars for signing up for this county pooled program on the crop insurance side that we would not have got had we not elected this. So these programs, I, I, I have seen it over and over and over again within our customer base, how much it has helped stop people from having to roll operating at the bank or really take a big hit in a drought year. And I would seriously look going forward into this next year at ECO and SEO because I think there's some conditions setting up that make it pretty likely to pay. Um, just like we went through last year and it actually I think has panned out the way that we thought. So since 2015 that was the first year we could enroll in these programs. We've had a $384,000 payout on these because we've had quite a few years of drought and some market fluctuation that triggered it that may not have been drought related. $69,000 in premium. So we've netted $314,000 on our 4,000 acre farm plus 94,000 that we're gonna net this year, I think. So about $409,000 over eight years. Um, on the farming side of things, that may not be a huge amount of money, but that actually added up over that many years, $400,000 is a lot of money that would have been rolled possibly in an operating note or debt that we'd be servicing at 8% right now. So, so really like these programs for buffering things in bad years. Is your premium gonna be a lot more than it was prior if you sign up for this? It, it is. But in those years where you have to pay that premium, more than likely your whole county, if it was good, your farm probably did okay too. There are chances that the county might have done well and your farm got hailed out or it didn't rain in your corner of the county and you don't get this money. That you go into this knowing. But from our experience, um, it's pretty well paid the way that it really should, at least in our counties that we're dealing with here. So uh, ERP program. Uh, phase two, if you if you didn't get paid in that last phase one of ERP last year, phase two is now open and there's a chance that you would qualify within that, especially if you were either had a bunch of crops that weren't insured for some reason or you fell in that gap between like you were just above a pay, payable level at the your 75% in your crop insurance, but it wasn't enough to trigger a claim and so you didn't get paid in ERP in the phase one, that's where you very well might qualify in this next round. So go to the FSA, get those apps. You fill it out off of your tax returns now. It's not based off of RMA data, so it's a different way of looking at it, which may either help or hurt you. But you can fill it all out off of their forms pretty easily off your tax returns and take that in, and then you can see basically what kind of payment that might trigger. So make sure you go to the FSA and approach them on this because 
they may not be really hounding people because most everybody got paid in phase one. But I think there's a fair number of you guys that intercropped or, or had stuff that fell in a gap that might qualify here. So long story short, if you didn't get paid in phase one, I'd look really hard at this program because why not try anyways. Um, once again, if you look at your quotes, uh, that'd be where you're going to make your decisions off of. And the ECO and SEO, the premium will stack on top of your other when you look at our quote sheets anyways to figure out what your total premium and your total coverage will be. Most important slide of the day, must use full legal, legal signatures in all documents. This is a major focus of the RMA especially. So we can no longer just print for you on the top, Wendy Falk or KWA by Wendy Falk LLC and then just have you sign Wendy Falk underneath. You have to hand write out KWA by Wendy Falk LLC and member. We got to do the whole thing. They're really hounding on this. They could void apps if we don't do this correctly. So we'll be hounding on you that as well on you guys. So make sure you just come prepared to sign the full thing when you come in or if we mail it to you, especially that's where it might slip through the cracks. Don't ever wait to turn in a claim if you think you have one. Um, that's probably the biggest problem that comes up in a claim scenario is, oh, shoot, I hauled this in now and I was 5,000 bushels short and I didn't think I would be. You're always way better off to turn the claim in early and then sign off on it later if you don't have a claim. Don't let adjusters throw all your production together if you have records to separate the units out. Um, that's a big one we're hounding on. We're going to work with our company more on this not happening too, but... Even if you're in enterprise units, you still probably have your optional unit structure in the background and you're keeping all that separate or you should be at harvest. If you did all the work to do those truckload records, don't let them then go and just spread all that production out willy-nilly over all your units. If you keep all that separate, it helps you in multiple different ways and it makes a big mess on the back end if you don't do that with us. So strongly encourage SEO and ECO with the current market and drought conditions. We're going to get into why that is. Never ever take YP on a crop insurance policy unless your agent gives you a good reason. You're way better off being in revenue protection and going down a level if you want to keep the premium than the same than if being a yield protection at a higher level. We have rolled customers into our agency. I don't know how many times that have been in YP. And if you were to think back on the claims that I know those customers should have been eligible for, there's probably hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes left out there on a decent sized farm. So. I'll get off my soapbox on that, but if it says R YP on any crop on your policy, make sure you get them to change that to RP or give you a reason why that is that way. Sometimes it's just out of laziness that some other agent hasn't ever looked at that and consulted you to change that. So enterprise units by type makes putting weed into enterprise units much more appealing, like we said. So make sure it says ET on there, not EU, because you have to elect that as well. And then always elect PLC at the FSA. This very well could change going forward as the ARC price ramps up if wheat prices stay up. But for now, I would stay in PLC and pick SEO on our side of it. So what are the odds of this paying going into this next year? This is, this is, is guiding your direction on the ECO SEO thing in my mind. So first off, if you look at where we're at in the wheat market and where we're at in the likelihood of a recession coming, this is the wheat market these gray areas where there's been recessions and pretty much every time there was a major recession, we've had a big decline in the wheat market as well, right? So um, it's not a guarantee. There are times we pulled through some recessions with inflation going on that wheat has run up and I am not a uh, crystal ball guy, but I'd say your odds are higher of the wheat market moving at least from where it's at right now, which also gives you a better chance of getting paid. So we have that. The probability that we're going into a recession, we are now up on the index that I looked at the other day in the internet up to about a 57% chance of that happening. Um, that's off from about 20% chance last fall. So that's ramping up as interest rates have been ramped up. So if, if we get a drop in these commodity markets, that can trigger payments on ECO and SEO separate from a drought even. So I would look at that for that purpose. Also, where are we at for soil moisture? Most of the high line is still in either a D2 or a D3 drought. So that ups your odds even higher rolling into this with poor subsoil moisture. And then where are we at predicted going forward for the rainfall, right? Because oftentimes we might start really dry and end up with a pretty good crop. I don't know how accurate this stuff is, but all I'm doing is trying to pool all the data together that shows the likelihood of this possibly working out next year. So for the temperature side of this for May, June, and July, it looks reasonably um, temperate up here, which is good news. 
But on the precipitation side, we are in the dark brown below normal um, likelihood up in our area on the high line here. So if you take all of these variables, throw them all together between the fact we're in an elevated market situation and we're still in a drought and we possibly at least are in a predicted drought coming, it makes it much more appealing to get enrolled in these county programs. So always choose RP if it's available on a crop. SEO is a good way to add coverage for drought and market declines. ECO adds even more top end coverage. And as you can see, even on our farm, that was another $76,000 payout this year um, that we would not have got on 4,000 acres had we not been in that program. But it's expensive. So if you're going to enroll in all of this, make sure you add all the premium up and you make sure you at least understand where you're going to end up at in the fall, right? 75% um, coverage in enterprise units seems to be your best value. Um, you still get a really high premium subsidy at that rate. If you try to go to 80% in enterprise units, of course the premium is going to go up because the odds of paying are higher. But on top of that, your subsidy starts tapering off really quickly and the premium ramps up more than it's worth, in my opinion. So I'd stick to 75% at the highest level on the enterprise units that you want to go. If you have a mall contract, that's well worth the money. If there was ever a year to kind of go all in on the insurance, I said this last fall too, and I think once again... The grain market actually stayed pretty stagnant, which was relatively surprising. I mean, it went up a bunch in the summer and came back to its current level. But I think we're going to get a lot more movement in the markets and we're in a drought scenario. So this was another really good year to enroll in those county programs on top of your current crop insurance, I think. So thanks so much for taking the time to go through this. It saves us a whole bunch of time on our end to meet with you individually and to not miss some of these things. And please always feel free to come in and meet with us. Even if you're not our customer, give us a call or whatever on an individual basis and we'd love to go through it with you. But hopefully this video helped. Um, hopefully you're not sleeping at this point. And thank you guys so much again for taking the time to go through all this stuff.